That was kind of a really dark patch for me when I moved here. I think that loss of the community from back home, that really affected my mood. I would try to go somewhere, you know, wherever it is, and I wouldn't run into people that I knew. And so it felt like, it felt almost empty to go to the mall or, or something. When you go out here, there's like top 40 music playing all the time. It's nice music and I, I don't mind it, but I, I suddenly started feeling that absence of Namibian culture, Namibian music. So I had to, to work my way out of that. One of the main things I started doing then was to, to teach music to as many people as possible and to share it with many people. And I found myself years down the road from that moment with a group of people singing and dancing and feeling like this is why I'm on the earth. I first came to Canada in 2006. I was on tour with the Moscato Youth Choir. We had a tour planned with two different choirs touring together. And my, my wife today was in that choir, uh, Oran. I was sitting with a bunch of girls chatting and whatnot, and all of a sudden I felt like this pressure and I got shoved aside a little bit. And then I, I turned and I looked and it was Garth. It was Garth and he just extended his hand and he said, hi. My name's Garth. And I said, <laughs> Garth Brooks? And that was such a lame response, but uh, it ju it's just what came out. And that was the first time we saw each other. And immediately, I don't know why she stood out so much for me. It was, it was like, wow. <laughs> we spoke and we got to know each other um, on the tour. The circumstances for meeting created a very romantic type atmosphere long bus rides where all you can do is talk. We had this weird thing where because of the music I was doing and she was doing, we got to visit each other quite frequently for about two years. And eventually I tried to convince her to move to Namibia. For her, she was, she was very close with her family and her sisters. And so she said, you know, why don't you consider moving to Canada? I didn't really see like, uh, an opportunity to move. I didn't think it was a good thing because the, the group I was in was doing really well. At the peak of that, our music was going on to MTV Africa, MTV Bass, it's called. Essentially, we were a boy band, you know? So we were starting to really take off, and then we got uh, an offer, like a deal. Uh, my mother came to me and said, hey, you know, Michelle is not gonna move here. The only way if you guys wanna be together, you have to go there. There's no other way. <laughs> I had to make a choice whether I wanted to sort of stay in the group. I decided, no. Overwhelming, everyone said, you should go to Canada, it's great, there's so many opportunities, and this, and, and it just went on and on. Everyone was saying, go, 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 and I, and I left. And uh, to make a long story short, Michelle and I got engaged. Here in Canada, our culture is a little bit closed off. Everyone's kind of doing their own thing, uh, living their own lives. In the end, he realized that being a musician created lots of opportunities for him here in Edmonton. And so he, that's how he started. He started by doing workshops, doing singing gigs, just singing music that he used to sing with Moscato. So through that network, he met many different musicians and teachers and a lot of supporters. So on my last day, I wear a Canadian tie, right? To the to bank. show that you're going to Canada, to Canada. now. Oh my gosh. <laughs> we were cheesy like that. that. We're cheesy like that. Oh, these two young people. I got a band together and we started performing for the Soft Cedars. And those would be like theaters, you know, in smaller towns. And we would do a show and say on a Friday night, Saturday night, and people would come to those shows. Canada, I found the audiences were great. They enjoyed the music. The prairies can seem pretty conservative in some ways, like a lot of country and Western 
So I was always curious as to how Garth's music would go over whenever we would play a small town concert. But he's just such an engaging personality on stage. He really interacts with the audience. And I think it's something fresh that people on the prairies haven't heard. For the first three years, even though I, I, I was doing music in the community and performing and performing on weekends, I was doing a lot of other jobs. So I had to be extra competitive. And it took me eight or nine years, but then eventually I switched over from all of the jobs like, to becoming a full-time self-employed individual. One year I got an invitation to do a children's festival. We didn't view what we were doing as children's music. It was just music. Many of the teachers throughout that week asked me, would I consider coming to their school and teaching that, wh whatever I was doing, <laughs> coming and teaching that, you know, for a day or two or, or maybe a week or, or something. And eventually I switched over from all of the jobs, like the things I was doing, to becoming a teacher of African music to schools. Like for me, it's just great that I can wake up and do music. Brooks, for the longest time, our community was very, it was very white middle class, you know, oil patch. And so in the last 15 years, we've really changed with our diversity. Our school is uh, all total about 440 students. Of those, around half of our students are English as a second language. Even our youngest students are impacted by media, by social media, by popular media. For us, it's an opportunity to break down those stereotypes and to break down even some of those preconceptions that the students have among each other. It's just a different way of, of looking at each other. Like the music's just a great opportunity to look beyond language or religion. I definitely think we've seen an impact here. The kids are excited and they're working together. There's definitely been an increase of school community and school culture with this. I remember one day after school, there was a couple kids singing John Bobuana, and uh, then all of a sudden the entire hallway was singing this song, and it was like grade four, five, and six, all singing the same song at the end of the day. It was like, this is really neat. This whole process has just really unified us as a school. Kids see a lot of stuff online nowadays that they never did before, but it's so different seeing it in person. And the fact that Garth gets to spend a whole week teaching the kids about Namibian culture, the food, they make masks, they learn about the flag, a little bit about the population, the geography. It's just more of an immersive experience that way. Namibia is in Africa. Africa is a big continent. If you know, if you can mention a country that is in Africa, put your hand up. If you know a country, just any country, yes. Ethiopia, yes. Kenya, yes. Ontario is not. I think the, the school shows that we've done with Garth are wonderful. Garth really works with the kids. He has them playing the xylophone, he has them playing percussion, he has them dancing, and he has them singing. So much of what kids do in school is working on your own. And you know, you draw a picture, you write an essay, you do your math homework. It's so important for kids to get to experience making music together. So shall we try just the drums again? One, two, three, and... I mean, there's all kinds of research into how music affects your brain as well. And when you're reading music and playing an instrument, every part of your brain is working together, which is kind of unique to music. And there's nothing else really that makes your brain work in the same way. Music gives kids a chance to explore their emotions. Uh, it's intellectual. I think that we're spending too much time sort of pressuring students to know what they want to be when they grow up but music teaches them who they are. And so they're gonna find out who they wanna be rather than what they wanna be. The important things for me is the, the sense of community that it gives the kids, especially like with their phones and with technology. Kids are just becoming locked in themselves. It's such a cool experience to see a kid just being scared and shy at, at the beginning and then just coming out of their shell and then being able to stand up there in front of the whole school and do their thing and be successful and create this positive experience that uh, they carry with them for the rest of their life.
there's always a moment in every residency where the kids sort of, you know, they they, they go into your heart. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> and then you're like, oh, I'm going to have to leave, right? And it was like yesterday there was that moment came. It was a grade ones. Kind of went from that big sort of energy to like, the small group of grade ones that I have. And there I am, you know, with them. And they're just so happy and thankful for everything. <laughs> Thank you for teaching us. I'm like, oh. So I had to figure out how am I going to teach African music traditions and styles to people here. I thought that the best way I could, could do it is if I actually studied music myself. Uh, Western music, so that I could read it. African music is oral traditions. It's evolving too. Think of it as if you, if you're, if someone tells you a story and you go and you tell the story to someone else, I can't expect you to go tell the story the exact same way. 2007, Cocapelli, my choir, went back to Namibia. I know Garth came with us for part of that tour. We would hear Moscato sing one song, and then we would travel to South Africa, and we would hear another choir sing the same song, but it was different. So it's like traditional music is, is really just music that's alive. These genres of music, they cross the ocean, and then they go back. Even myself, I go back so that I can keep learning. I have to keep, you know, I can't be disconnected from the African continent and just be teaching. You have to have that connection. And also happy to, to take the things I learned here back to Namibia. This is the first time I'm going back in nine years. Nine years feels like a long time because uh, I haven't seen my friends, I haven't seen my family, and I wonder what has changed and I, I wonder what is still the same. Everybody can sing, but as far as the love of music, there was something about the talent that always came from Kwisip Munt. When I came in uh, to this residency and I looked at the kids, I told them that I'm doing these uh, residencies abroad and concerts. I have a couple of things that I know that you can learn, but for the most part, you're here to teach the students abroad how to do this. It's a little bit too much for me, okay? <laughs> when, I, when I teach uh, students in Canada, only the, the best of the best like groups of students are gonna sing in harmony and you're already doing that. That was excellent. I'll see you tomorrow, we'll work on uh, some more songs. It still doesn't feel real. I still feel like any moment now I'm gonna wake up and I'm gonna be back in Edmonton, which wouldn't be too sad because my family's there now, but it still feels like a dream. It hasn't settled in yet for me, and I don't know at what point I'm gonna reach that point where I feel like I'm really here, you know, and I'm not there yet. As a child, I didn't really think that I would want to be a musician one day, because at the time, there was a real push for uh, academic subjects. I spent one year at boarding school and went back to Namibia, and that was when I saw the Moscato Youth Choir perform. Um, and that choir, well, they were performing traditional African music, which seemed way more fun. <laughs> they were moving. How Moscato actually um, changed me from a person who I was to who I am now currently. I was a problematic person, basically. I did a lot of bad stuff. But then he actually introduced me to a new environment as well, the environment of hanging out, being with people that really cares about you. Before I entered choir, I used to stay at home all the time. But when I came to choir, I like sort of blossomed. I, came, I became a social butterfly because now I'm not afraid to approach anyone. So yeah, I want to introduce you to some, someone, my best friend, Garth Prinzonski. I went to go visit him in Canada a few years ago and 
to see his family and see, see how far he came with disappointment and then picking yourself up from that and saying, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to push through this and do even better. And I think that's, that's fantastic. You can, guys can give him a... It was really difficult to move to a new country. And I, I slipped into almost what I would call a depression for a while, right? And how did I come out of that? Um, I decided, you know what? If I miss back home so much, I'm gonna start teaching people the music from back home. That's what I did. So over there, they have a music curriculum. So just like you learn mathematics in school here, it's a subject, music is a subject there. Like you go to school, like you're going from class to class, and it's, it, it was so exciting for me to see. So I would just teach it to anybody because I just wanted to hear human beings singing that music back to me. <laughs> <laughs> When you give kids the platform to enhance themselves through music, you can get it right in Canada or in Namibia or in America. It doesn't matter where you go, because kids want the same thing. They want opportunity. I approach the choir as in, what can you teach me? Because they're singing it every day. They're performing it every day. And a lot of the, the students in that choir are coming from the rural areas and they're singing it at home every day. What I've learned is self-confidence. I write my own music as well. And the inspiration for my songs are heartbreak, anger, the, like the normal feelings we have as people, you know? I used to think that love was afraid Till it stepped into my back with an arrow I never felt this way I was in pain But I guess that's just the way I grew up in the choir. There was a sense of magic that the choir had that I never understood. After about two years, I realized that the secret lied in the love that you have to have for these kids. These kids need me, but more so, I need them. They are my, they're my oxygen. I breathe. When I'm in front of them, I get alive. Moscato, the youth choir, is really responsible for my success today as an artist. Even my success as an entrepreneur, as a teacher, uh, because through the choir, I learned how to work diligently towards a goal. That's just how I approach every project now. It's like I take a little bit of Moscato with me. I think it was the first three or four days it didn't really feel like I'd been home because I came and did the exact same thing that I do almost every day in Canada now is I, I teach music to kids. Greetings to you. Now say greetings to you. Where it really sunk in for me that, you know, I'm back home was the day I brought the two groups together and I also had the band there. When the kids sang, the band played, in that moment, this is no longer a dream, you know, this is, this is real. They said, Garth, if you go to any school and you bring a band 
and you work with the kids for a week and you put that together, that's gonna happen. And you just, you've just been gone for too long. <laughs> as a Namibian, a lot of times growing up there myself, you feel like you don't really have something to offer to the rest of the world. But that's, I feel like that's what this project has shown me is that there's so much that the rest of the world could learn from us. I know for sure that this is my calling and it, it has a potential to impact not just these students, but thousands of other students around the world. It's gone from something that I do with my mind to this is who I am now. And I think that's what this whole trip has meant. In a sense, I feel like I have two homes now. Namibia will always be home to me, it will always feel like home, but I think my role in Edmonton or in Canada is also very important. And in that sense, I feel very accomplished because there's a little bit of my own culture that I now run into a lot here in Edmonton. Sometimes I would go to a school and kids would say, I already know this song. <laughs> Hands here, who's worked with me before? Okay, then you, then you know this one, right?